crew members, in order to overcome the earthly gravitation, have been subjected to a state of hibernation. That is, the human body had put through a congealing process, simulating an apparent death. At a preset time, under the impulses of an electric brain, the heart resumes its normal beat. The lungs begin their regular functioning. The blood flowing evenly again. In short, man is reacquiring his earthly faculties. Good evening. You're watching PNT. I'm your host, and I have a confession to make. Up front this week, according to an article by the Huffington Post, one small town sheriff certainly wasn't shy about expressing his feelings about being stripped of his position. Richard Lee of Croydon, New Hampshire, has nobly served as sheriff of the small community for over 20 years, but recently lost his job when a three-member board voted to eliminate the one-man position, moving Croydon's services to the New Hampshire State Police instead. Lee was present at the meeting and was asked to immediately surrender his cruiser, guns, and uniform. Ever the one to follow the letter of the law, Lee complied, stripping himself naked on the spot, surrendering everything on him belonging to the department. Guns, badge, radio, car, and uniform, including his shirt, pants, and jacket. Lee then turned calmly and with his injured pride shivering in the cold, a determined and indignant ex-sheriff walked nearly a mile in the cold before being picked up by his wife and taken home. Asked later why he maintained such a rigid attitude about surrendering the clothing, Lee only pointed out that if he had left with the gear, he would have been arrested for it. While no one likes being fired, one has to wonder at Sheriff Lee's extreme reaction, and with a little digging, PNT found out that Lee had faced down just such a vote back in May of 2019, winning out against those seeking to eliminate his position. With what seems almost prophetic words, he was quoted at the time as stating that the vote was, quote, totally personal, and stated, I step on toes. I don't care who you are, if you commit a crime, you will be arrested. But some people don't think they should be arrested. Ominous and prophetic words indeed, and given Mr. Lee's current lack of a position, we can easily see that Lee seems to have done some toe-stepping, and not to the advantage of his employment. For PNT's part, we have to thank Mr. Lee for his service and sympathize with his frustrations, but also have to point out the admirable style he displayed in choosing to confront the inevitable by adhering to a strict code of honor, if not one of dress. From stripping sheriffs to strange mysteries, the next story in our weekly roundup of the weird takes us to the Bermuda Triangle, where one marine biologist claims to have found the long-lost wreck of the SS Cotopaxi. First launched into service in 1918, the SS Cotopaxi was one of 17 steam-powered bulk carrier ships and spent her time running the route between U.S. and South American ports. She had an ignominious career, running aground in December of 1918 and in 1919 colliding with and sinking a smaller ship. Her real claim to fame came later with her final voyage. On November 29, 1925, the SS Cotopaxi left South Carolina bound for Havana, Cuba, and sailed straight into the Bermuda Triangle and history. Her final message came on December 1st in the form of a distress call, reporting that the ship was caught in a tropical storm and listing badly. No further messages came from the Cotopaxi, and on December 21st it was declared overdue, and yet another victim of the infamous Bermuda Triangle. The Bermuda Triangle is a vast area and covers the open waters defined by Florida, Bermuda, and Puerto Rico. It has an infamous reputation, being called by some sailors as the Devil's Triangle or Hurricane Alley. More ships and aircraft, it is said, go missing here more often than in any other place in the world. While experts may debate the statistics, we can safely say that the Triangle counts as some of the most highly trafficked in the world 
with boats ranging in size from small private craft to enormous cruise ships that ply the warm waters. Private and commercial aircraft are often seen in the skies as they fly overhead. But is it then simply coincidence that disappearances such as Flight 19 occur, that the compass variations experienced by boats and planes for centuries are nothing but random chance, that the more fantastic tales of time travel and UFO are just that, tales? The Triangle, it would seem, prefers to keep its secrets. But that apparently didn't sit well with diver and author Michael Barnett, who had begun to suspect that a sunken wreck known as the Bear Wreck might in fact be the long-lost Cotopaxi. Coming through historical documents dating back to the early 1920s, Barnett and his team discovered a previously unknown distress call sent by the Cotopaxi on December 1, 1925. Tracing the location of the signal and matching it to the ship's route, Barnett soon discovered that the well-known Bears Wreck location, boiler measurements, and length matched that of the missing ship, positively identifying it as the SS Cotopaxi and putting to rest almost a century of rumor and speculation. When asked about the legends surrounding the ship and the Bermuda Triangle itself, Barnett was dismissive. Personally, I believe it's all folklore. While some point to theories of a power source deep beneath the waves, a holdover from Atlantis perhaps is the source of most of the vanishings, scientists dismiss this and other possibilities like wormholes or aliens, pointing instead to the presence of the Gulf Stream and its often rough weather as the more likely reasons for the disappearances. For PMT's part, we prefer to keep a rational but open mind on the matter, but would be remiss in failing to point out that whatever it was that sent the SS Code Epoxy to the bottom of the ocean one December day in 1925, the fame and date of the Code Epoxy would seem to be as enduring as the Triangle itself, and solved or not, will be forever a part of its mystery. We'll be back in just a few moments with the final part of our program, but first, a word from our sponsor. Does the dog in your life have a personality all his own? Does he seem to understand your moods? Is he sad when you're sad? Happy when you're happy? Does he come to you when he needs help? Does he appreciate what you do for him? Is he fond of you just because you're you? Do you feed him kennel meal? New concentrated kennel meal. When you pour on water, concentrated kennel meal bursts into meaty goodness. Looks like ground beef. For meat red kennel meal is real meat meal with meat aroma, meat flavor. Come and get it. Get protein and energy in every bite. The concentrated goodness of kennel meal. And what about the dog in your life? Is he as healthy and happy as you can make him? Do you feed him kennel meal? New concentrated kennel meal? Welcome back, and remember, always be certain to feed the dog in your life kennel meal. Serve him up some of that meaty goodness in one of our PMT logo coffee mugs found in our Teespring store. Laugh as he shreds the soft cotton fabric of your PMT t-shirt, jumping at the kennel meal with all the vim and vigor you've come to know from him slash her. Get some today. For the final part of our weekly roundup of the weird, PNT is pleased to bring you a pair of remarkable UFO sightings drawn from the MUFON database. Filmed on November 3rd, 2019, the videos taken of the multi-witness event appear to show two UFOs appearing in sequence, a large triangular and then saucer-shaped craft rotating and moving through the skies over Manly Beach, New South Wales, Australia. Let's have a look at the footage.
Oh, oh yeah. What the hell is yeah. that? No. For I sure. Mean, that was no. Really yeah. <laughs> oh my god. What is it? It's just not like that's what? not how aeroplanes or helicopters move. They don't rise up slowly like oh. that. Helicopters move, couldn't it? No, but that's just I don't think that's a helicopter. That's just right. moving another way. That's why I've got oh. Edward Scissorhand. One, two, three, four. <laughs> It's on the fourth finger. <laughs> yeah. I, what is that? It's getting further away like the other one. Yeah. The other well, one there's been two of them. I wonder if we'll say third really? one. So there was two. Yeah. No, because this one started much bigger and lower. Indeed. Yeah, that's right. I bet when it was a bit smaller. Remember we were having this chat, Mum, about, was that with you? I was having this chat about UFOs not long ago.
So what were the strange objects recorded moving slowly through the skies over Manly Beach, New South Wales, Australia? Let's run down the possibilities. The objects in the video are clearly not birds, clouds, stars, meteors, and most atmospheric phenomena. We can also rule out flares, both aerial and lens. That would bring us to the next likely culprit, balloons. The objects seen here do seem to float lightly, as though they might be filled with helium, or perhaps being borne aloft on a breeze. Our immediate first impression was that we were looking at stray pool floats, or toys that had been tossed into the air and were floating about, only to be captured by the witnesses, but we needed to run down things a bit further. If these were balloons, how large would they need to be in order to match the objects in the video? So how about the size? How can we tell how large the objects in the video really are? An excellent question. Determining the size of an object in the air is extremely difficult without any static foreground elements to compare it against. A building, a tree, streetlights. All elements of relatively standard size that can serve as a basis for comparison. When a video contains no other elements to judge against, it leaves us with only two possibilities. Either we are looking at a small craft close to our viewpoint, thus appearing to be a much larger object, or the reverse. A large craft seen at a far distance, making the object look small to our point of view. Really, without at least one reference point, it's impossible to determine size. This is yet another reason why you should not zoom in when filming an object. Always hold your phone sideways and keep the surrounding landscape in view. Trust that your camera will record the object, even if you don't see it on the screen. In this case, the witness has at least provided us with a partial reference point, a railing or fence. The witnesses do make mention of the fence during the encounter, so we can assume that they were outdoors and likely at one of the many hotels scattered throughout the Manly Beach, Ivanhoe Park area. While we cannot know for certain the height of the fence, we can take an educated guess that it is likely 8 to 10 feet tall. This gives us at least one point to work with. Looking at the objects now, using the size of the wall as a reference reveals that we still don't know for certain. We can make a good guess, though, of roughly 10 to 20 feet in diameter, and likely more. Assuming that we are looking at a smaller object close up, we can see that it would still have to be of some size in order to match the one seen here, falling easily within this range. If we were looking at a large object at a distance, then the same rule would apply except that the objects would be much larger indeed, which it appears they might be in this case. The more we looked at the footage and the motions of the objects, however, the more interesting things became. But more on that in a moment. Despite the fact that we felt we had an answer, PMT sticks to a set list of possible causes, and we needed to exhaust that list first. Leaving our balloon explanation tethered for the moment, PNT turned our attention to the next possible cause. Drones. Could these be drones? While one should never underestimate the creativity of someone with time and money on their hands, the silhouette and pattern of flight just don't match. Commercial or private aircraft, then? As is our standard procedure, PNT searches for all airports nearby a sighting, and usually finds several. This case is no different, and as usual, there are no shortage of nearby airfields, with Sydney Airport less than 12 miles away. While the objects clearly do not match the profile of any known to be in private or commercial service, it's a fact worth mentioning nonetheless. So what about military craft? As with airports, PNT also searches for the presence of nearby military installations, and there are several worth noting nearby with RAAF Glenbrook within 40 miles of the sighting location and a handful of smaller installations between. Could we be looking at a test of advanced drones or smaller surveillance craft? Perhaps a coordinated test of smart drones. Without confirmation from the military, there's no way to be certain, and that, of course, is assuming that they would do so in the first place. Unfortunately, there's simply no way to either account or discount this as a possibility. The fact is that there is a military presence, but the question remains as to whether or not there are craft being tested that match the parameters seen here. 
and why the military would be doing so over a heavily populated area filled with tourists carrying cameras everywhere they go. The more we tried to narrow down other causes, the more they pointed back to our original balloon hypothesis. The motions of the objects certainly appear to float. We now know that we would be looking for balloons of an extremely large size. Could we perhaps find a triangular pool float that large? What about the inner tubes shaped saucer? Our research answered some questions, but raised others. Your garden variety pool float or armchair would obviously be too small, but was there beach equipment that would fit the bill? Yes and no. Our searching led us to the makers of what can only be called water playground equipment. Aquaglide, a company specializing in large-scale floats, sells items that prove a close match to these seen in the video, including triangular floats, slides, and large circular platforms. Could a pair of these caught in an ocean updraft account for the objects on the video? While this might seem easily proven, there's more to this answer than one would think. There are several anomalies to consider. First, let's consider the enormous size and weight of this equipment, a minimum of several hundred pounds, and the fact that it was designed specifically to battle repeated exposure to wind and water. Given the enormous cost of the floats, it's a given that a company would not be so careless enough as to allow one, or much less two of these, to be carried away by a random gust of wind, provided that the wind would be strong enough to carry it away in the first place. Moreover, if it were a breeze or gust responsible, how would the triangular craft maintain altitude and spin in place? We examined that motion closely and were unable to find a single anchor point for a rope or a line, one that did not appear to turn end for end along with the others. How could the donut-shaped craft appear to drift slowly and then change shape before suddenly reappearing in the distance? Could a balloon or piece of aquatic equipment be carried nearly out of view that rapidly? But first, we have to ask an even more basic question. Are there any aquatic parks in the Manly area that could provide the source of the runaway floats? With a little searching, we found two parks nearby, Manly Surf and Slide and Jungle Float. Troubles arise, however, when a look at the Manly Surf and Slide calendar proved that they were not even operating in November. Moreover, Neither installation is large enough to even sport water toys of that size, with jungle float consisting only of a single craft with slides. In our searches, PMT was unable to find any aqua park nearby that had any aqua glide equipment at all, which would leave us only with the possibility that the objects were deliberately filled with a lighter than air gas such as helium and then sent aloft which begins to get problematic and expensive if the only purpose is to hoax a UFO sighting in order to give the folks back home a chuckle. We're not saying that it couldn't be done, simply that it would be time-consuming, expensive, and very difficult to arrange. The reactions of the witnesses themselves certainly do not seem to be those of hoaxers. Rather, they appear to run the emotional gamut from excitement to skepticism to outright disbelief. But they are certainly compelling, and they provide us with an on-the-spot and detailed record of the witness's state of mind at the time. As we have seen over the course of our investigations, PMT has found genuine witness reactions are difficult to fake. People who are confronted with the unknown are rarely silent about it. And here we can hear a group of people attempting to explain what their eyes were showing them. There is no evidence of scripted behavior or coordination that we can detect, and their reactions seem genuine. Superman or not, these tourists saw something they were not familiar with, and were excited about it. So, with even our most likely explanation called into doubt, we can turn our attention at last to the boundless possibilities presented by the unknown. What if the objects recorded over Manly Park, Australia earlier last November are exactly what they appear to be? Unidentified craft apparently under intelligent control. What would such a craft's power source be? How does it manage to move lazily about like a leaf on the breeze and then rapidly accelerate into the distance without a sound? Then there are the more intriguing questions. Who created this technology and why is it here? 
Is it a part of the pattern that PMT has discovered linking a growing number of UFO sightings with remote wilderness areas or protected wildlife sanctuaries? And if so, then what is behind the apparent increase in visitations over those areas? Are these mysterious visitors, as we have suggested in the past, observing or preserving samples of our ecosphere before the fragile species are irreparably damaged? What would their motivations for this be? Simple scientific curiosity? Or perhaps, are they driven by a deeper need and a deeper purpose? What if, instead of extraterrestrial or alien zookeepers, these sightings are being caused by the human race itself? That instead of aliens acting as curators, we ourselves have somehow breached the boundaries of time and space in an attempt to influence our own development, possibly to correct it after some apocalypse, or perhaps as a preventative measure designed against such a catastrophe, or even to prevent other races from doing the same to us. Are we seeking to correct a mistake or to prevent a disaster? Could the answer to the UFO phenomenon literally be staring us right in the face? Are we that alien face? Could we, in some future, be causing what the past reports as a UFO? Could scientists then be attempting to influence what we perceive as now? Have we been doing so all along? randomly looking in on our own development, unable to overcome the innate urge to meddle with ourselves. Is it just random chance, or do these visitations have a more desperate purpose behind them? What might cause such a dilemma for our future selves, and what would a prudent planet desperate to survive do? How far would we go to save ourselves and our planet? What would we do? What will we do? Paradoxical questions to ponder the next time you look up from our small blue world, caught in enraptured amazement at the wonders of the universe. But whether or not the strange objects filmed turning, floating, and moving through the skies over manly Australia last November were overly large party floats caught on the ocean breeze, the product of a secret military experiment, or something else entirely. We'll leave up to you to decide. Sound off in the comment section below with your thoughts. That's it for this time, faithful viewers. Be sure to click like, share, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to be notified when PMT presents your next portion of The Paranormal. I'm your host, reminding you to keep an open mind, because a closed one shuts out the truth.